Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to this conversation and discussion about, as we said here, sustainable development in the Euro Mediterranean. How do you align um, COVID recovery with sustainable development goals? That's what's on the agenda for discussion. We have a range of contributors who can give us a perspective which is both global, European. We have a foundation, a significant foundation leader, and we have someone who can give us examples of where it actually works. The key issue regarding the particular sustainable development goal, which is 17, is at fundamentally a, 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 a fulcrum for all the others, which is about the policy tools that we require to move them forward. In essence, there are three things that need to happen. One is collaboration, the other is cooperation, and the third is partnership. Whilst to all of you that might seem the same things, they're not. And those of you who've been working in the field and those of you who've been working with partners across the piece will know there can often be differences in view about what that means. So this is what we have in conversation for, for you in the next hour. And um, all I ask you to do is, those of you who are on Zoom, uh, please make sure that you are on mute. And when you need to speak, when you'd like to raise a, raise a question or a query, please use your virtual hand and I'll make sure that I can bring you in as soon as possible. Um, and now other than that, and make sure your screen's on and your name is correct on the screen also. So without a further ado, what I'd like to do is invite um, Angelo uh, Ricciaboni, who is the chair of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and is also chair of the Partnership and Research Innovation in the Mediterranean uh, Area, Prima Foundation. So, uh, Angelo, if I can start with you to give us uh, a picture, give us a sense and an assessment of how things are currently and in this context of the actions being taken by government, but also what that picture tells us about what we need to do, given, given that we all know we have 10 years left in order to make sure we achieve this fantastic um, um, set of arrangements which are called the Global you know, social, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Ankala, over to you. I can't hear you, one second. You need to unmute. Is he mute? Ah, okay. excellent, yes. welcome. Good afternoon, thank you for your invitation. I'm very pleased to join this very important conversation. As you said, it's very important to give the picture. In particular, it's great because yesterday, SDSN, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, led by Jeffrey Sachs, has published the annual sustainable development report. So we have a, a clear picture of what's happening in the, in the world. And in particular, I would like to start saying that if we want to see at how countries are performing towards SDGs and Agenda 2030, we can see that the situation is not that good, but fortunately there are 15 countries, which are the 15 European countries, which are the best performers. So in terms of Europe, how Europe performs, we have at the first 15 positions, 15 European countries. Uh, of these, we have the Mediterraneans are not doing so good because France is a fourth, but then we have a Slovenian 12. But if we want to go to the southern rim of the Mediterranean, we have Israel only 40th, Algeria 56th. So Europe is doing very well for SDGs, but the north of Europe, why the Mediterranean is not doing that well. In terms of uh, SDGs and uh, in this conversation, it is very, very important because the frame of SDGs is fundamental in order to build back better. And uh, what uh, I would like to add uh, as far as uh, this report by SDSN is concerned is that this year, there's a clear focus on COVID and the impact of COVID. So I suggest you to read this report for many more details. I would like to underscore that COVID has a short-term negative impacts on most SDGs. Mm -hmm. This is the first point. And these impacts, unfortunately, are amplified for the vulnerable groups. Second point, the most negative effects are on SDG 1, no poverty, SDG 2, zero hunger, SDG 3, good health, SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, and SDG 10, 
reduce inequalities. Sure. So this report shows that there are clear problems as far as these uh, SDGs are concerned. The third point I would like to highlight is that countries in Asia Pacific area have answered, have responded better than others to the COVID-19 COVID outbreak. And in this report, you will find an index which shows which was the effectiveness to answer to the uh, pandemic. And this is only for the OECD countries. And unfortunately, European, sorry, Mediterranean countries didn't do very well. Greece, 19, but then you have Italy, 29, France, 30, Spain, 33. So COVID was very bad for uh, our SDGs, but also our countries didn't answer very, very, very well. So in terms of a food for thought, our report is also showing uh, uh, some clear indications for the Euro-Mediterranean area. In particular, there is a study that uh, I would like to show if I'm allowed. We are doing a, st a study to uh, show uh, which, are, which is the situation for Euro-Mediterranean countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, if uh, I'm allowed to show it through Zoom, it is clear that the Euro-Mediterranean area is not doing uh, well at all. I give you some just just some data. Yeah. In the Euro-Mediterranean countries, we have 50 million people who are at risk of poverty. 50 million. Human rights and opportunity for women must be improved. Just an indicator. We have uh, that only. 35% uh, of uh, people of members of parliament are women in uh, Europe and 18 in mid, uh, Middle East and North Africa, 18. Obesity affects between 18 and 35% of the population. Uh, in terms of number, 35 million in the European, Euro, European uh, countries of the Mediterranean, in North Africa, 34 million, in the Middle East, 24 million. There are too many sustainable, uh, unsustainable agricultural, agricultural practices. Mm. In, terms of, in terms of waste water treatment, in North Africa, only 13% of uh, people are uh, connected. In terms of investment in research and, 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 uh, and uh, investment, we have uh, only 0.3% of GDP in East Mediterranean countries, 0.4% in uh, North Africa counties. In terms of accessibility to internet, only 54% of people in Middle East and North Africa are connected to internet. To mm -hmm. internet. So this means that clear data show that there are challenges in front of us and partnerships are crucial in order to deal with them. So I want to stop here because I know that time is very short, but the picture is clear. Partnership are so important. Just one word to say that Prima, which is the major initiative on research sure. innovation on agri-food, is one of the answers. We want to have more answers. This is just one. Thank you very much. Angelo, before you go, so you gave us a lot of data, okay? There's a lot of information in what you said, and people find that hard to retain. Uh, but you, I know that you had, some, you had a graph or a slide, which I think visually, I think gives us quite an arresting view of how we stand. Do you still have that? Are you able to uh, 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 flick it on, share it yes. with us? I, yes, please, if, if uh, you need to allow me to show it, because it is, I'm not able to do it. Ah, I see. Do okay, we'll do it, we'll do it, don't worry. And if you could just, just summarize what you just said through that graph, it would be helpful for people to understand the gravity of the situation and the, and the distance we need to travel. Yes. It's just coming uh, up, just give us a minute. Yes. Okay, so the just, next slide. Yeah. There we go. This, yes. This is the slide which shows this is prepared, was prepared by SDSN Mediterranean, the uh, uh, network I'm coordinating within SDSN Global. You can see here a lot of uh, red lights, a lot of uh, orange light which showed that the situation is critical or mm. is not doing well at all. So you see that unfortunately, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, there mm -hmm. are many reds and many oranges. And this is the point. I mean, we, need, we are 
rather far from achieving SDGs. And here you can see which are the critical areas. You can see that, for instance, for SDG number one, the situation compared to other SDGs are very bad. Uh, it's not that bad, but if you look at, for instance, number uh, nine or number uh, two, you have uh, critical issues. So this is a guide for governments, for policymakers, in order to improve their situation. So what you're really saying, when we look at that graph, there's so much red there and, uh, and you know, orange and yellow. It means that with 10 years to go, we're in trouble, really. Isn't that what you're saying? Across yes. the piece. I mean, the idea is that you should have it all green. It means that you are aligned with uh, Agenda 2030 and they are coming. No, change. indeed, indeed, absolutely. But it just shows you that actually we, we ha this is very helpful because this gives you at a glance the, the, the distance we need to travel, but also the height um, of political will that needs to be traversed if we're going to actually make a, any dent in the next 10 years um, on something which the, the world uh, you know, congratulated itself on coming together and agreeing a set of goals to make our world more sustainable. And here we have, uh, with 10 years to go, a very clear assessment that, you know, we're in, we're in trouble. Uh, and even though COVID may have affected us, I don't think that red is a result of COVID. Is that the case? No. Yes, I mean, okay. this shows the situation for 2019. As I said before, okay. unfortunately, some SDGs were hit by COVID, like Indeed. number one, two, three, eight, ten. Okay. The so, pre-COVID. Sure. Ankela, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions uh, coming towards you in terms of, you know, I think the question is, okay, what do we do? But in that context, I'd like to bring in Anna. Anna, you're from the European Union. You, you're head of division at the uh, EAS um, uh, in terms of neighborhood policy. Um, Anna, welcome. What we'd like to hear from you is what's the EU doing in terms of um, supporting building back better, recovering better in the context of um, Euromed uh, relations. In terms of when you look at that graph, how are you responding? What are you doing? Yes, hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to contribute to this discussion. And thank, thank you very much to the Friends of Europe for having invited me as well. Pleasure. My intention today is to present what Europe is doing uh, to respond to the COVID pandemic in relation to the third countries. And I will try to focus on the region, of course, in particular. So first of all, uh, the COVID pandemic has affected all of us. Europe was among the first and hardest hit. But of course, you, you, mu you must remember the very difficult situation in our member states, uh, Italy, Spain, Belgium, other countries, where we were fighting in the first days of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic with the disastrous situation. At the same time, we were trying to repatriate our citizens stranded across the world. Over 600,000 citizens who were far from their homes and not able to come back. Sure. And yet already then, it is in this particular difficult crisis situation in Europe, the EU has reached out to the third countries and, the, and put forward a very ambitious offer, a Team Europe package. That was a joint initiative of the High Representative and the European Commission, putting together a package, uh, gathering member states, EU institutions, financial European institutions, bringing all that together to make sure we can respond in a very quick and effective manner. But before I go to the d details of the, of the financial package, mm -hmm. I would like to underline one very important element, multilateralism. Yes. I think that's, that's the key thing that we saw in the, in the times of the pandemic, that we cannot respond to global crisis in a partial fragmented way. So, you know, any global issue, any global crisis has to be responded in a global way. Mm. And that's why we've been engaging extremely closely with multilateral partners, UN in the first place, World, uh, World Health Organization, of course, 
And here I would like to underline that the European Union, together with its member states, is the largest donor to the World, uh, to the world Health Organization. Mm. And we brought a lot of funding in this first uh, difficult days. Sure. Also, the initiatives in the framework of the G7, G20, the death uh, initiatives, also fighting uh, for having the vaccine and the um, equal access to, to vaccine and treatment. You know, the European Union was on the, of the, on the forefront of these efforts. Now, coming to the Team Europe in terms of financial aspects, we have managed to gather in a, in a matter of weeks 36 billion euro of funding. And this is a coordinated common figure for the EU institutions, for the member states, for the financial institutions like the EIB, EBRD, its grants, loans, macrofinancial assistance, all bundled together. But it's also important that it comes together to, to somehow respond to the same um, challenge. In terms of the southern Mediterranean region, uh, I will just give you a figure from the European institutions um, so far. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the very quick, immediate response comes very often first from our humanitarian uh, strand. Indeed. And there we have engaged 68 uh, million euro. From the more long term funding, we have managed to reorient to 0.1 billion euro to basically respond to the COVID needs. And we also mobilized at a very, very, very record speed the macrofinancial assistance, notably for Tunisia and Jordan. And overall, the figure stood at 800 million euro. Mm -hmm. So it's really a very, very um, considerable effort mobilized at the record time. And this was the first immediate reaction, which focused on the two immediate elements, one being health mm -hmm. and the health systems in the partner countries, and the other strength, the liquidity of the economy and social economic impact. So that's the first immediate response. But I think the key question is what comes next? What is this medium to, ter to long term um, response that we can um, shape. And I think that here is where the partnership comes into play in particular. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I think we are still all very far from knowing what the impact of the pandemic will be. But I think one thing is sure and clear, it will be huge for both shores of Mediterranean, for the whole world. So it's important to see how we can factor all these elements in in the future, how we can first understand the impact, the evolving impact and the needs and the realities on the ground. And that we can only hear from our partners and to be able to respond to their needs. We have been already engaging in that discussions in many ways. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me give you just one example of the very successful recent Brussels conference on the future support to Syria and the region, mm -hmm. where we had uh, among many sessions also specific dialogue days and dedicated sessions with civil society on the impact of COVID and the future needs. I know also that there, are, there is work ongoing in the framework of the civil society on forum Majalat on impact of COVID and we will discuss it uh, early next year in this annual big gathering in Brussels mm -hmm. or now it will be probably virtual. But I think this is absolutely crucial to get these insights from the civil society, from the partner countries to okay. be able to respond. And just to finish, let me bring two elements from our side in terms of the future, long term future. First, is the initiative of the High Representative, Joseph Borrell, who launched in mid-May in the framework of the Council, so with, his, uh, minister, with the Ministers of Foreign Affairs of the EU, a first discussion on rethinking the relationship with the Southern Mediterranean mm -hmm. in the light of the COVID pandemic. Of course, that could be only the very first discussion, because, of course, the pandemic still continues, evolves, 
and we will continue that. But this is a very important element. Mm -hmm. Another one is the work that we are now launching to prepare the next seven years programming of financial assistance. Sure. Under the new financial framework, which is still basically being negotiated. Indeed, it is. But the work is starting. Mm. And of course, um, consultations with the partners, with all different strands, and civil society, so civil society yes. will be particularly important. Sure. Just as, a, as my final word is to say that partnership is crucial to be able for all of us to shape this future together uh -huh. to have a better post-COVID reality, more sustainable, more inclusive. Indeed, thank indeed. Anna, thank you. And you know, um, it's those words are repeated by so many people and, and that's not to challenge you unnecessarily. We know that is the case, but we know that it's very kind of um, uh, in terms of actual evidence of partnership or seeing the progress being made, it doesn't seem to be felt, especially when you look at the chart that we that Angelo showed. It shows we've got a, a big distance to travel, and despite the fact that I know Team Europe has marshaled billions of, of finance, um, it, which is good, I suppose the question is how will that be put to use in a way that can both assist immediately but in the long term? But I'll ask, I'll ask you to think about that. I think one of the most important things you said, of all the things you said, is about multilateralism. And the fact is that what we experienced was the, uh, that actually, in terms of the virus, one of the casualties was multilateralism, where everyone turned in on themselves and you know, went it alone. Um, so I want you to kind of think about how do we, how does the EU uh, um, fill a void of multilateralism that we've seen, the challenges that we've seen to global governance structures, and actually walk in a different way into this next five or seven years. But I'd like to ask, I'd like to open it up to our audience. We have a lot of people there on Zoom. Would I just ask you again to make sure you have your camera on? That would be helpful and your name is correct, but can I ask you to use your virtual hand to raise if you would like to ask a question. And what I'd like you to do is reflect on what you've heard. There are many people from all over. Uh, it'll be really interesting to hear from some of those, those of you who are in the region, uh, some of those you experience, um, uh, and others. So over, if I can um, see if there's any questions at all. I'm just waiting. Nasser, where are you? Hello. Hello. Do you hear me very well? Sorry. Just speak up a bit more, Nasser. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you hear me very well. We can hear you now. Okay. Please welcome uh, and please do introduce yourself. Uh, so I am Nasser Nasser. I'm from Morocco. And I'm actually, uh, I am a college student. I have been just recently an ambassador of Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange when it comes to, to the basic exchange. And actually, I have tons of questions, but that I'm going to just focus on when it comes to education. And uh, I, I'm sure that uh, Europe and North Africa, they are not on the same level when it comes to, to educational level, especially when it comes to virtual world, uh, because the COVID-19 really uh, impacted uh, the, the way of learning. In, in the North Africa. And so the question is, um, what could Europe really help the, the Mediterranean region to have an equal, um, equal um, to be in the same level when it comes to, uh, to technology, uh, technology uh, materials, or uh, to have the access more to the internet and to the virtual world. I, I know that, uh, that our countries in North Africa, and especially Morocco, uh, should really invest in that domain. But I know that we have, we suffer from many struggles and, and this COVID-19 make it worse. Mm -hmm. And I, I am now, I make it worse. And, and I know that it's not the same as, not the same as Europe because uh, we, we differ in, in, a lot of, in a lot of things. But what really could Europe help on that? Because uh -huh. I, I have been an ambassador and I have seen how really Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange impacted many of, of students in, in Morocco. Uh -huh. But I still want to know what could we do uh, extra, something extra to really to solidify uh, our, our, our access to internet and to, to virtual world. And Nasser, thank you very much for that. So in terms of um, what you've just said, so the money that you've just heard of from, uh, from Anna, you want to have some of that earmarked for internet infrastructure and education, is that right? 
Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, this, uh, yeah, in that, in that side. Okay, excellent. Can I see if, uh, if Khatija, Khatija, are you, st are you there? Khatija Amhal? Wanted to pull you in. Are you there? No. What about Sirin? Sirin? Ben Brahim, are you there? I'm failing miserably. I want to bring in some younger voices um, <laughs> into this conversation. No? Anyone there bold enough to put their hand up? Come on. It's a great opportunity to get, get engaged in this conversation. Hala, are you there? Hala Bugagis? No, I'm failing miserably. Okay. I think what I'll do then is you're obviously warming up. And let's say that we, once we've had our next contributor, uh, let's see if I can get more of you engaged uh, into the conversation. So it gives me great pleasure now to turn uh, the conversation uh, from looking at what the data says, uh, what government, uh, what the EU is doing, but to a foundation that has the Annalyn Foundation, which is funding a great deal of support um, um, across uh, the Euromed region. But its focus is around intercultural dialogues. So and Nabil gives me great pleasure to invite you to contribute. And I'd like you to say um, why you think, in the context of what we've heard, that intercultural dialogue is both the policy tools and the means for us to really move things forward. Nabil, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dermendra. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Friends of Europe for hosting and organizing this event in collaboration with the Annelian Foundation. Uh, as we are today highlighting the importance of uh, SDG 17, I would like to reiterate that the Foundation values the importance of our key partnership to ensure that the Euro-Mediterranean region is at the core of the EU policies. I would also like to welcome and thank our esteemed guests and participants to attend this important discussion, as well as welcoming our young uh, people and contributors. The question, Dermendra, how can intercultural dialogue help us understand the current situation in the Euro-Med uh, region? Uh, as some of you already know, the Annelin Foundation uh, uh, for the for dialogue of culture was created in 2004. It is the first Euro Mediterranean institution uh, in this regard. The uh, foundation also one of its uh, points of strength is that it brings not only governments, 42 governments of the region, but also 42 heads of networks. In other words, the Annelin Foundation uh, is probably the only foundation of its uh, kind that brings both governments and civil mm. society. You cannot actually work with one of them and, uh, and leave the other. So uh, how do we do that? How do we achieve our goals? Of course, through intercultural dialogue, uh, through our uh, uh, flagship uh, programs like Young Mediterranean Voices, which, by the way, started out as uh, Young Arab Voices, started in the countries of the south of the mm -hmm. Mediterranean, and then was transferred to, the, to uh, uh, the Western countries of uh, Europe. Uh, I will not uh, go uh, into more details on what we are doing. Uh, let's, let me uh, change the focus now, is how did we respond to COVID-19? Uh, COVID-19, of course, is the first, the first global crisis with a totally humanitarian dimension in recent times, of course, that pushed to the second uh, level ec uh, economic and financial activities and shackled uh, local hierarchies. In other words, uh, the fear actually is that uh, development, uh, cooperation, partnerships will be put on the back burner as a result of, uh, of COVID-19. Mm. This is what we do not want to happen. Uh, we are saying very clearly and very, in a, in a very uh, 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 cluster clear voice that uh, this would be the devastating uh, option. It would be even more devastating than the uh, disease itself uh, because we feel that uh, uh, th this disease which has crossed borders, uh, which does not recognize borders actually, 
can only be met by more partnerships, by more working together, and, and not by less mm -hmm. uh, working together. This would be the totally uh, 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 wrong uh, option to take at this moment. Uh, um, how, how can it help? How, how can uh, the Annaland Foundation, with its unique uh, composition that I talked uh, about a little while ago, how can it help create the partnership for closer uh, collaboration in the future? By the way, we issued a call, the Annaland Foundation, in uh, collaboration with UNIMED uh, in Italy. Uh, we published a call for all Euro Mediterranean organizations to join us in uh, spreading uh, a word uh, to uh, all stakeholders, to all donors. Uh, I, there will be a, a manifesto actually published soon. Uh, and we invite all organizations that would like to join us to have this manifesto highlighting the importance of continuing intercultural dialogue work, partnership work, uh, multilateralism, uh, uh, as the only way actually to deal with this uh, crisis. So we feel at the Annaland Foundation they are, that we are well positioned to uh, uh, play a key role in highlighting the importance of uh, continued partnership and highlighting the importance of working towards uh, achieving SDG 17, uh, because if we fail to do so, we will all suffer. I would like to conclude also by saying that the foundation has, fa has faced many storms before. Mm -hmm. And of course, th this year, by the way, is a unique year because this year we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Barcelona Declaration. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will have activities, uh, hopefully in, uh, towards the end of the year in Barcelona to look back at what happened during these 25 years and how can we learn from the lessons of the past years and how we can look uh, to the future. So uh, uh, Mediterranean integration for us is one of the key pillars in overcoming the crisis and should be seen as a new growth model. Only a real common political impulse to support, this, uh, to support and strengthen Euro-Mediterranean ties by forming new partnerships and consolidating the old ones will overcome this ordeal together. It is by common action that we will effectively com combat the temptation to identitarian closure, which threatens our countries in the north and in the south. I, I am aware of the time, conscious of the time, so I will stop here. Nabil, thank, thank you, you very, thank you very, very much for that. One of the things I just wanted to just, um, I suppose explore with you is that you spoke about the fact that you know you you have this unique role you do some fantastic work in creating the young med voices you cr you know you've done this partnership in creating virtual connections between young people in Europe and the med region in the context of covid how much have you seen in terms of the continuity of that sentiment for you as a key civil society organization that's funding the voluntary sector and these individuals because actually if we're going to recover from this, young people on both shores are going to have to connect with each other because they are, I hate to say it in a romanticized way, our future. What is your experience in terms of, what does it tell you about what you've learned in this time, about um, how hopeful we can be, uh, given your experience as a very, in, you're an independent foundation, if you like. Um, how's it been? What, could you, what lessons can you share? Yes, I can basically share uh, really a, a lesson of concern. Uh, we've heard really in, in, uh, at our foundation, many, especially among young people mm -hmm. uh, uh, who are suffering uh, of unemployment and poverty and all of that, especially in countries of the South before the pandemic. So there is definitely more concern, more okay. worry about these issues. But there is at the same time a feeling that our fate is intertwined. Mm. Uh, in all countries of the region mm -hmm. and nobody can achieve these goals the goals of development for our countries mm -hmm. uh, alone okay. uh, the, the message of uh, multilateralism is alive and well at least among the people at least among civil society that we're dealing with we can hear a voice of concern of worry but uh -huh. we can also hear a voice of commitment 
and dedication to the cause of multilateralism. One of the things I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring in our, our audience, because we now have a, quite a few people uh, raring to come in, which is excellent. And I'd like all our speakers to think about this, actually, is that we've had a multilateralism that's been a formal set of institutions, governments, if you like. I wonder if there's scope for creating a people-to-people -people multilateralism, actually bringing young voices and young people's experiences from both shores and forge a different kind of multilateralism. And it seems to me that the Annalyn Foundation could be at the heart of that. But I won't bring you in to respond to but for you to think about. And Nasser, I haven't forgotten you. Don't worry. I will come back to your question in a moment, okay? I haven't forgotten you at all. But I want to bring out Zinab. Zinab, are you there? Hello. Welcome. Oh. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh -huh. Please introduce yourself. Where are you? Okay. My name is Dina, but I'm uh, from Egypt. I'm connecting also from Cairo here. Um, I'm part of the YMV. Um, Young Mediterranean Voices, yeah. Young Mediterranean Voices, Great. as well as uh, the Erasmus Plus debate activity as an ambassador and trainer as well. Um, I'm also kind of agree with Nasser's uh, question uh, about how to give more. Uh, being an ambassador, like transferring the virtual exchange program during the pandemic, when everyone is suffering, like mm -hmm. uh, from mobility, for example, and people like many programs, EU-based uh, uh, financial programs in Egypt stopped uh, their their activities stopped to be implemented physically, mm -hmm. and many of them have turned it to be uh, virtually. Yeah. So um, we still like from my job, like when I was promoting for the program, like I find many people like also still facing challenges like we could all we could reach yes we could reach uh, people who could not reach these programs before uh, now they have access virtually but still there are our categories of people like the refugees, marginalized communities, they cannot have access to internet or have like technology gadgets. So uh, we as volunteers like did what it takes like to offer these programs uh, as ambassadors, like to give them like laptops and so on, or to hold like sessions for them and to aid them just to, to get to have these uh, access to these programs, but it still is not enough because uh, we are doing these uh, jobs individually. So the question here is like how the EU like mm. uh, maintain investing in ambassadors like us, young people like us, who is holding the responsibility for these programs um, yeah. in, in maintaining okay. our job in our local um, arena or spectrum. Thank and I so suppose, much. Zinab, one of the things you're actually yeah. also alerting to, which I've, I found that across all my experiences, is that you have ambassadors like yourselves, but you have not the tools or the means sometimes. And it's almost as if like one of the things that the EU could do is to give you almost a, um, a kind of a, a premium, a, a credit, if you like, to be able to create the online capacity that each ambassador has a sum of money to spend to make connections across both regions. And that's something to think about. Let me know what you think, and or others of you on Zoom, if that's possible. Enrico, are you there? Hi, Enrico. I can't hear you, unfortunately. It looks like you're on the move, you're in the car. <laughs> no, we can't hear you, Enrico. Okay, if you can sort your volume out, I'll come back to you. But I can't, I can't hear you at all, okay? So I'll come back to you if you can sort your volume out and my colleagues will be able to be in touch with you via text. Iyad, Iyad, are you there? Iyad Al-Dajani? Yes, yes, I am, I am there. Um, I have a question. I Welcome. Have Please, it, where are you currently? Just introduce yourself. I'm currently in East Jerusalem, by the way, and uh, I'm stuck here because of COVID-19. I right. work at the Schiller University at the Yenna Center for Reconciliation Studies. So I'm also a project coordinator for the Middle uh, for academic uh, reconciliation in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, we do this meeting for all academics in the Middle East and North Africa to develop reconciliation studies between uh, to engage into knowledge and education between European universities and universities uh, in the Arab world. So we are also working with the Erasmus Plus projects. Uh, uh, we try to submit for them a lot, and, and there's like a big problem now because of this COVID-19, and our project is developing this for higher education institutions, how to work on peace and conflict transformation and 
and peace studies in, in, in conflict areas. And we would like to understand how you can empower those kind of projects with, the, with your uh, SDG 19. And even today, I was discussing this with people from the university in Bethlehem about the problem that they're switching everything online. And we have also this problem how this will happen and how funding for it will be happening if you are considering to fund projects that really target higher education institutions in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, this was my question. Uh, I tried to keep it as much as uh, slow as it comes. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you for, very much for joining us. And I'll, come, I'll make sure your question is answered by our colleagues, both at the European Commission, but also at, uh, um, at Anna Lind. I want to bring in Nonna. Nonna, who's our, our final contributor, um, who um, I hope you can share with us. You've heard what the context is. Where are there examples of cooperation, collaboration, partnership working that's good? And what lessons can we learn from them? Thank you and welcome, Nonna. Thank you and thank you for having me here. So my name is Nonna Dupré. I'm the head of the Partnership Instrument Unit in the Service for Foreign Policy Instruments of the European Commission. And on behalf of Hilde Hardeman, my director and head of service, I really want to thank you for this opportunity to participate in this conversation. Um, our service is really about turning the EU's foreign policy into action. And let me just immediately start by reassuring the previous speaker, Nabil El Sharif. I mean, the EU is really there, um, will not put partnerships on the back burner. We are in this together um, because we've seen once again that the COVID crisis has, has shown how interdependent our societies are and our economies. And this calls rather for stepping up international cooperation against the coronavirus and, of course, for a more just, sustainable, peaceful post-COVID-19 world. And again, um, I also want to reply maybe already to some of the, 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 the participants. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a key moment where the short-term goals are completely align with the EU's short long-term goals, because building back better is a growth strategy, is fully aligned with the, with the green transition, with the digital transition, and brings us closer to the sustainable development goals. So we can make the most of the remaining 10 years ahead only if we work together across borders on a new normal that is more sustainable and more inclusive and thus also more digital. And so this is really where we need to work on this together. So building on what Anna said uh, earlier on um, in this conversation, um, to make this change happen, the EU launched its Team Europe effort to build stronger partnerships and this is with citizens, between citizens. So we have these programs between cities, between governments, but of course also bringing in the civil society, bringing in business and international institutions from Europe, the Mediterranean and abroad. So that together we can roll out recovery plans that strike a new deal between nature and people. So if I just look at, let me give a few concrete examples. Okay. So starting with the health recovery, um, we work on, we know that antimicrobial resistance and COVID crisis, they exacerbate each other. So the current COVID-19 pandemic already threatens to weaken the already endangered microbials uh, as there is a spike in the antibiotic use. So this could lead to, again, to more resistant bacterial infections. And again, this is where multilateralism comes in because mm -hmm. the EU works together with WHO, with the FAO, the World the Food and Agriculture Organization, and of course with the World Organization for Animal Health. Um, and we work um, on these actions together in the Americas um, and in Asia. Um, because, well, the, the examples that I will bring come from my, my work and we work mainly in Asia and in the Americas. So, of course, we also work with European and Latin American business, for example, to champion clean energy solutions okay. to build a carbonized and circular economy. So this is, again, on the growth strategy and on okay. the impact. But, no, no, if I can, can kind of push you, because if I can push you, just because we're, we're running out of time yes. as well, I don't want to, uh, you know, not give you the time that you need, but tell us what, what do you think are the key ingredients, though? Because we, we've seen the chart. We know what the color is, it's red. What do you take from your, uh, your experience is, is of the partnerships that we need to be thinking about? So what are the practical yes. things well, we need to do? Well, for me, what is also really important is to bring in the totality of the population. So I would be looking at SDG 5 also and gender equality. Mm -hmm. And 
this is also really needed on economic recovery. If you don't take into account the total population, you will not get okay. full recovery. That's one. But also, I would also focus on SDG 16, on peaceful and inclusive societies, mm -hmm. because otherwise the COVID-19 risks to become a major setback for the international community. And there, let me give you one example. For example, in, in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we support the Kinshasa police mm -hmm. to escalate tensions. And we strengthen in particular the capacities and the role of police women in the public health response and more gender responsive policing. And this is also very important to the previous, uh, there was a participant who was speaking about the refugee communities mm -hmm. who are of course okay. more vulnerable. So it's really also important to focus on them. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting example about the Kinshasa police in terms of de-escalating problems, as you said, in the use of women uh, of officers. That's excellent. We, I would like to Definitely bring in our debate. Just, just one more um, really priority, I think, for the EU. Very briefly. Information. Because Very that is really important. We need to diffuse anxiety so that we can better tackle the virus together. Mm -hmm. and to provide reliable information. To better information. Them. Okay, thank you. I want to bring in um, our Debating Europe citizens platform. We have over 5 million uh, people who engage regularly on policy matters and things that matter to them. I have Ed, uh, Joe, Joe, our editor of Debating Europe. What are our, what are our citizens asking? Hi, Damendra. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, yes, so, so I'm Joe Tabarski, the editor of Debating Europe. So our citizens have sent in uh, lots of questions on this. I, I'm going to read one because I realize we don't have much time. Um, it was sent in from Corrado, and he sketches quite a sort of pessimistic scenario. I think he's sort of looking for reassurance that he might be wrong. He's, he's basically he's worried uh, that in the, the Middle East and North Africa, we risk seeing uh, increasing mass protests, uh, public anger and political instability because mm. of uh, a lot of the issues that we've been talking about. He's, he highlights rising unemployment due to lockdowns, the crash in oil prices, collapse of, of tourism and, and on and on. Um, and then his, his fear is that uh, he thinks Europe should support its partners in the region, but he worries that Europe is going to be distracted by internal divisions, uh, the need for all sorts of reforms and so on, and that the political will, which has come up again and again in our conversation today, uh, won't be there to, to meet these challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and as a way of kind of highlighting this, he points out uh, that I think the, the Team Europe uh, fund has been discussed. Uh, I think it's worth 36 billion euros globally. Um, and that compared to, for example, the sort of sums that are being talked about when we, when we look at Europe's uh, like next generation EU, Europe's mm -hmm. kind of coronavirus recovery fund, that's, that's I think 750 billion euros, uh, possibly leveraging up to 1.85 trillion euros. There's a mm -hmm. huge difference there. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, Corrado's fear that the, 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 the basically Europe won't meet the, the challenge. It's very pessimistic. I think he's looking for reassurance. Mm -hmm. It'd be very interesting to hear what people's thoughts are on Joe, that. thank you so much. So Anna, I want to turn to you, I want, if, I, if I may, if I, very briefly to respond to some of the key issues. It's, about, it's not about, okay, this, this question was about the size of money and how do you leverage it. But a lot of you, people you've, you've heard, there's concern about how do you make sure you use it for digital infrastructure, but also uh, making sure that it enables young people who are ambassadors to work differently and better. Anna, back to you. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for all your questions. Um, first of all, let me welcome the work of the Anna Lind Foundation. It's mm -hmm. absolutely crucial. So mm -hmm. just wanted to make sure this is underlined. Then on a number of question, uh, questions, multilateralism is the cornerstone of our external action. This was reaffirmed again by all the member states and the EU last June, and I think that now with COVID we see it even more clear. So we really need, we depend on the rules-based international order. Sure. On Erasmus, I'm very happy to see people who have benefited from Erasmus, Indeed. Erasmus Plus, who are working on Erasmus Plus. So let me take this opportunity to advertise, to advertise what the EU is doing on Erasmus Plus. Just a very a simple fact. In the Mediterranean region, in the last southern Mediterranean region, over the last five years, over 44,000 people have benefited from Erasmus. Sure, of course. But Anna, if I, if I may, that's great. 
People are asking for reassurances into the future. What can you say to the young people you've heard? Can more go into digital? Can you provide more kind of uh, actual uh, capital to individuals to take forward? Can you, f you know, focus and prioritize this issue of education and mobility and, and, and online? Yes, I'm coming to that. So digital is um, one of the priorities of the, of, the, of the new leadership, the European Commission, as you know. And it's indeed for us absolutely important. I think this is also uh, quite clear now with the pandemic that without this digital aspect and broader connectivity, we wouldn't be able to have this debate today. Sure. So we are but well, you, you and I aren't in Morocco. You've heard from people from the Middle East. They want assurance that actually that money that you 32 billion will go into education and infrastructure and partnerships. Can you tell us today that that will be earmarked in that way? Well, where the money would go depends on all of us. So I would like to recall that this is part of the programming process that is starting now. Okay. And in the programming process, there is the consultation phase mm -hmm. where we want to hear from our partners, authorities, but also uh, other strands of civil society, what we want to put the money on. Okay. Now, be very clear. One thing is grants. The other thing is massive investments like digital. You yeah. know, if you want broadband connection, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's huge money. And that we are also prepared to support by the new scheme, uh, which is quite innovative now, uh, which was put forward by the EU recently. Mm -hmm. The new guarantees, the mm -hmm. European Sustainable Fund for Development, mm -hmm. which will basically try to bring the investment to the region. So private sector, financial institutions. Okay. But for that to happen, we also have to have the conditions in place, governance, you know, conditions sure. that, bring, okay. that attract investors. Okay. I'm going to have to cut you short, Sarah, uh, uh, Anna, because I think we, you know, that we need to have got a, quite a few others in, in li lined up, but I'll come back to you in a moment. So, Yaha, Yaya, uh, Yahya, Yahya, Yahya. Hi, welcome. Yeah. Where are you? much um so hello everyone i hope you're all doing well and safe so um i'm talking from uh, dimnet city um i am student's representative uh, at the university council uh, uh i am an online foundation alumni and uh, currently i'm qualified to be online facilitator and uh, in the intercultural dialogue and uh, i am a trainer a debate trainer with the erasmus plus virtual exchange program so my interventions um, is going about i am going to talk about uh, sdgs and uh, the role of the citizens then i will mention a little bit about the intercultural dialogue but we need so, to be brief yeah i'm afraid so brief generally the conditions that help uh, the spread of uh, the covid 19 are linked to the poor uh, health conditions for education on uh, how actually they deal, deal with the situations. So uh, if we work more about the issues, uh, if any pandemic, uh, not only COVID-19 or any sort of problems mm -hmm. uh, will be solved very uh, easily and uh, so quickly about uh, the role of the citizens. There is collaboration and sustainability. Mm -hmm. So uh, both requires an action plan that people can work on together to ensure long term impact uh, even the type of project selected should uh, yield long-term impact, and uh, 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 I assure from people can help. So um, about the intercultural dialogue. Yeah, I need you to uh, brief because because uh, your connection is really poor uh, also, so I people can't hear you. Intercultural dialogue and uh, virtual activities are very important. Uh, it's play uh, a good role in uh, building the personality of the, the young people from the Mediterranean region, uh, build, uh, help the young people from uh, this region okay. uh, build up bounds uh, between each other so they know more uh, about each other and they know more about uh, uh, different backgrounds. In okay. Different so that's Thank you. And, uh, and, uh, Thank you for joining us. And sorry, I have to cut you short. I'm going to go to Mohammed. Mohammed El Fahaz, are you okay. there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, Mohammed, welcome. Where are you? Uh, thank you. I'm Mohammed Hafiz. I'm from Amman, Jordan. Uh, I uh, work for the Royal Institute for Interfaith Studies. That's uh, the head of the Annaline Foundation Network in Jordan. Okay. Uh, I work as communication media and social media manager, and I just graduated from Princeton University of Technology. Uh, okay. As, uh, 
administration. Good to have you on. What's your question? What's your or, or issue? My, my question um, that uh, it's focusing on the goal number 16 and goal number 17, the peace and justice uh, strong institution. Actually, the region uh, now more than ever, it's, it needs solidarity. So the, the funds that's coming from the EU, it's really great. It's making a great impact. But I believe that it can create a better and some more sustainable impact if uh, the region, um, uh, if it's going to the region without like conflicts. Like right, right now, we need like uh, for a global case fire, especially in the region that's always on fire. So uh, if the, the peace is spreading in the region, I believe uh, all the funds and all the projects that's going uh, to, to the MENA region and to the Mediterranean region will be much better and creating much sustainable solutions. So uh, do you believe that uh, in the future we could reach to this point uh, or not, especially nowadays all the youth and the world, like they uh, start realizing that we, we are all like a global citizens more than ever in the, in the middle of the forced uh, uh, manufacturing. Uh, OK, uh, so, so you uh, want the money to make sure it focuses on these two goals? It's, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. OK, thank you very much. You. I have also Nage. Nage, are you there? Or Nage, if I've, if I've got it wrong. Thank you, by the way. Th Nage, are you there? No. Mm -hmm. Ah. Are you coming online? Yes. Hello. Yes. Okay. Hello. Uh, my question: uh, I am Nagih from uh, the Egyptian Association uh, for Youth and the Community uh, Development from Egypt. Uh -huh. uh, Welcome. Thank you for uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. And my question for uh, Dr. Nabil: How? Uh, how with the, uh, with the help of using technology and the international culture exchange can a success story be promoted uh, or inspired by others a new way of uh, overcome this crisis can virtual uh, interaction help overcome feeling of shock and uh, an inspire institution with new ways for uh, sharing and networking uh, for example, the Anna Lind uh, Foundation uh, process. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And finally, Enrico. Enrico Molinaro, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? I can sort of faintly hear you. I can't see you, though. Can, Where are you? Can you hear me better? Ah, I, you're back. I hope now it's better. A little bit. Okay, my, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the Annalyn Foundation in Italy uh, National Network, and I would like to thank uh, Professor Riccaboni for the invitation, who is uh, participating with us uh, and uh, our director, uh, Nabila Sharif, to an important event I want to invite all of you in the little island of Ponza, near Rome, on, on September Lovely. 11. Uh, now you've got uh, shamelessly plugged your event. Excellent. Yes. All of you are invited to the Sponsa Prima Med event, second edition, which is uh, sponsored by the, 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 all the major, the major uh, Euromed organizations, including the UFM, because it's in the preliminary event for the summit you mentioned before, actually, Al Sharif mentioned before about the 25th anniversary. But it's the same island where Altiero Spinelli uh, uh, was uh, uh, confined uh, before going to the closer island Ventotene and he wrote his manifesto. So we want to launch a Euromed manifesto okay. on the topic of Prima, Prima Foundation, which is uh, sustainability in the uh, fields of uh, 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 eco economy, um, the food, food security, um, and circular economy, and the fight against uh, uh, the climate change. So okay. you are all invited. Thank you. So that was it. You've, you've used the opportunity to plug your event. Thank you very much. I thought you could have a question, but no worries. Angelo, can I bring you in just very briefly? In terms of what you've heard, are you reassured? But I need you to be very brief. I think that what emerges is that the role of partnerships, because uh, many students or many uh, said about, uh, talked about education. We need to work more and more building bridges mm -hmm. among the shores 
and I'm very pleased of uh, Erasmus, but also research and innovation can do a lot. So for instance, uh, the initiative I mentioned before, co-founded by the European Commission with uh, 270 million euros and by 19 countries with 270 million euros. So we have uh, half a billion euros working to promote uh, cooperation among researchers, innovators on the two shores. That is very important. Mm -hmm. We need to build bridges. We, we need to deal with uh, SDG number 17 with concrete actions, not just with blah blahs. There are too yeah. many blah blahs around. <laughs> so Europe is very good. People yeah. love Europe when they do what I'm seeing. Prima is a clear initiative in that sense. Thank you. I love your notion of there's too much blah, blah. Let's hope we can reduce the blah, blah and get more action going. I want Nabil. I don't want to invite all the other speakers. I do apologize. It's that I don't have time. Uh, but I would say to Anna, you've heard a lot here about people wanting more uh, sense of guarantee about that it'll actually respond to young people's livelihoods. And I hope you take that away. You can. And I, I also encourage all of you to engage with the commission on that. Nabil, well, you've heard quite a lot. You have a significant role, and I want to conclude with you in terms of what you've heard. What can you do to take forward the, uh, the, why the Young Med Voices initiative, especially the virtual element, but also is there a way in which you can match European money to create some sort of um, capital premium for young ambassadors to use to make sure they've got money in their pocket to really actually move this agenda forward, which will be a different form of multilateralism, a people-to-people -people multilateralism? Over to you, Nabil. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, really uh, there are many lessons learned from the pandemic. Of course, there are some uh, negative lessons and there are some positive ones. And of course, I would like to really uh, respond to the question on uh, e-education and uh, e-learning and the potential that we have discovered as human beings that has not been fully uh, tapped in the f in the past. I think the Annie Lind Foundation has been leading also in terms of uh, uh, virtual uh, communication, uh, uh, enhancing that among young people. And now the question is, uh, how can we uh, uh, learn from learn from the lessons of uh, COVID-19 and move forward? I think uh, uh, there is a great potential that the Annie Lind Foundation can do through Erasmus Plus. Mm -hmm. through young Mediterranean uh, voices, uh, yeah, tapping the huge resource of the uh, 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 virtual communication. Uh, and the question, of course, that you ask, how can we turn that into projects, into opportunities uh, for young people? I think this is something for, for us really to reflect on uh -huh. uh, at the Anna Lind Foundation. Uh, how can we maybe push this uh, uh, communication a bit forward to create more opportunities for young people. So it is not just getting to understand each other uh, uh, on both shores of the Mediterranean, but also how can we build the future mm -hmm. together, uh, mm -hmm. our, our common future, how can we build it together? I think for us really, this is something that needs uh, more reflection, I have to be honest with you, in order to uh, be able to enhance this communication between people of the uh, two shores of the Mediterranean. Nabil, thank you very much. Colleagues, I have to wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our contributors and all of you for being uh, both patient, engaging, uh, and I hope you found this um, an interesting discussion. But the main, I suppose the one takeaway is that I think that multilateralism shouldn't be left to political leaders. Uh, I think a key issue is that multilateralism is, especially for the young people that are on the Zoom audience, I would say to you, take multilateralism into your own hands and create a different form of uh, youth uh, informed, led and galvanized multilateralism and show the way. But I think the lessons for funders and leaders is actually to provide you with the, apt, the means to actually walk for, forward, but actually faster on this agenda. Uh, thank you all very much. Continue to engage with us. And I would also say to those of you who are Young Med Voices and others, continue to engage with the Commission on this consultation so they hear loud and clear that where the money should go is to support what you have been raising in this conversation. Thank you very much. Tune into our website for our next set of debates. And thank you all very much. Be safe, uh, be well, and mind your distance. Thank you very much for joining us at Friends of Europe. Thank you.